Welcome, as I said, my name is Stephanie Peat. I'm part of the Professional Learning and Leadership Team at Education Scotland and I will be facilitating today's session. I'm glad to be joined by Sam Anson and I've, I've written down Sam's job role because I will forget it, so I'm just going to read it out just now. So Sam is the Joint Head of the COVID Education Strategy and Recovery Division and we also have Dr Dave Caesar with us today as well. Dave is the Interim Deputy Chief Medical Officer. I'm going to run through some practicalities with you before I hand over to our experts. So I'm going to go through some protocols just about how the online session will run. We'll get an update from Dave on the state of the um, pandemic and then we'll get an update on the guidance from Sam. Then we'll go straight into the questions and I will invite those who have submitted their questions to ask them on mic. If they don't want to do that, I can do that for them. And then we'll close about 4.45. So some of you might have been in sessions like this before. If you have, please excuse me while I repeat some of this. So if you just make sure that your uh, microphone is muted unless you obviously are speaking, and that'll just help with any background noise. Um, same with video. There are a few of us on the call today, so if we have our videos off, if you want to turn it on when you're speaking, that's fine, but if you have it off when you're not speaking, that would be helpful just to make sure that it doesn't interfere with the bandwidth. That would be great. You are very much welcome to post any comments, questions and thoughts into the chat pane and we can pick up on them and feed them in throughout the course of the session. And it's just to give you a heads up that the session will be recorded. OK, so it will pick up on who is talking and on the screen. So if you don't wish to be on the recording, just an extra reminder to keep your video off and to input through the chat pane if you don't want to be in the recording at all. So what to expect, so when you signed up for this event, you did submit lots of different questions and what we did is collated the questions under different themes and we shared them with um, Sam and Dave in advance just so that they knew what kinds of things we were looking to speak about. So a representative will ask the panel the questions that we've got. As I said, if they don't want to ask them, I will ask them for them. And you've got the chat pane if any extra comments or questions come to mind and I will feed them in as appropriate. So I hope you find the session useful. I'm going to pass you over to Dave and Sam who will kick us off this afternoon. Thanks everyone. Thanks Steph. So I'm just going to share my screen here. Um, now just, just see if it will work. It looks like it. So hopefully you see the map of the world uh, soon. Can someone tell me if they can see that? Is that okay? Yeah. A nod. Great. Thanks. Thanks Steph. So um start with the with the bleeding obvious so um this is just a reminder that we are in a global situation and our and if you like our safety is um uh is part and parcel of the of the global state of affairs so whilst we pay pay particular attention to what's happening uh in scotland in the uk uh, in our communities um this is a a global issue and just to, to remind ourselves of that so uh, so that we can't kind of think about this in isolation of what's going on uh, globally. Um, there we go. So where are we just now? So a um, couple of days old, this data, but um, we'll give you a sense of where we are. So just to orientate you, y-axis is a case rate per 100,000, and on the, on the x-axis is uh, timeline uh, dates. Um, so you can see uh, the sort of curve of the rates, and we had a, a big spike over uh, of cases over the summer that you'll you will no doubt will be aware of. We've had a, quite a rapid decline in those cases, um, largely due to a number of factors, including vaccination, school holidays, and and some of the sort of natural progression of the Delta variant. So it does tend to spike rapidly and then fall quite rapidly it seems but um, but we're learning more about that all the time um, and whilst um, the most recent R number which is a three week old number uh, let's not forget um, is below one which is good which means that the the pandemic is uh, uh, shrinking in size uh, in Scotland uh, we have seen a, a recent and especially today recent uptick in cases that's probably representative of the release of restrictions that happened around the beginning of August, August the 9th. So we're nine days following that and we're seeing a rise in cases as um, uh, increased transmission happens in community settings. 
Um, and this is the sort of, again, similar sort of timeline on the bottom uh, on the right. The graph on the right is, a, is a, uh, a more magnified view of the most recent date. So it's the same, but a, 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 a closer view at the last month or so. Um, and split by age group uh, on the left, broader age bands. So the highest age band uh, in the July peak has been the 20 to 39 year olds. That's been quite consistent throughout all of the waves. Uh, so younger working age uh, adults uh, have been where most of the cases have occurred. Um, and, um, uh, and and we are seeing it in all, all ages, but no, no age, um, if you like, is particularly... Uh, vulnerable by dint of their age. This is largely a product of um, uh, uh, people's contact patterns and their behaviour rather than rather than anything else. And then when you translate that those cases, so again, just to orientate you, the graph on the left is so the green line is the case rate. Uh, uh, sorry, sorry, my my mistake. So the blue the blue filled line is the case rate. The green line are hospital inpatients, and the red line hospital admissions uh, so uh, what we're seeing is um, again and I'll show this in, in more detail in a moment which is that despite the very large largest spike of cases that we've had over the summer we're not seeing the same number of uh, people coming into hospital and that is un undoubtedly due to the vaccination program um, and uh, on the right, you can see that split by age groups, which whilst a large bulk of, um, uh, of cases in the, um, uh, in the peak around uh, before and around the turn of the year involved uh, those uh, over 60 and especially over 80, you can see that there's a much lower proportion uh, of uh, cases that are coming in from that age group this time around. Uh, and this um, represents that according to uh, uh, mortality, so death data. So again, similar sort of layout of the slide, but you can see the the, the numbers uh, over the summer have been um, an, an order of magnitude uh, less um, than they have been in previous waves, and that is undoubtedly uh, due to the uh, to the vaccination program and the rollout of the vaccination. Uh, so speaking of which, where are we at with vaccination? So again, slight, this is a week old now, but um, you'll see that um, in, uh, so so at nearly, uh, I think it's something like 78% now, as of yesterday, uh, of all adults over 18 have now been vaccinated twice. But that belies um, a kind of a fairly large proportion of those at a younger age group who are not yet vaccinated. But encouragingly, those in the youngest age groups at the moment, 18 to 29, 74% of them have had their first vaccine. And, and one would suppose, not unreasonably, that uh, the vast majority of those will go on to have their second vaccine, 81% um, in the 30 to 39-year-olds. So um, that is incredibly encouraging um, and uh, much higher than, uh, than previous uh, large-scale vaccination programs that we've run in Scotland uh, for example, around flu and uh, even at those higher higher risk groups. So, um, so we are we are getting there, but we, as expected, are not quite there yet. Um, but we hope to we hope to to, bri to bridge that gap over the next um, six uh, next four weeks or so. Actually, so it should uh, those second doses should come into play. Um, what we're less certain of is exactly what will happen over the next. Um, uh, is over the next little while. So there are a number of different scenarios, uh, but but largely speaking, uh, it is uh, high. It is well. We have a reasonably high level of confidence that cases will increase. And in fact, today we've seen that in, in for one day's data. Uh, but it's likely that they will increase. Uh, the the unknown is just by what magnitude, and also how that translates into um, significant. Uh, disease and death uh, but um, as every week goes past we have a higher degree of um, uh, population that is vaccinated and protected against those uh, worse outcomes and um, what we do know with with a high level of certainty is that these cases even though they might be high numbers are not not representing 
um, a, high uh, a high proportion of significant or uh, severe disease. So many of these are asymptomatic. Many of our hospital admissions are um, uh, that are recorded as being uh, COVID positive are incident are found to be incidental COVID positivity rather than there because of COVID symptoms. Uh, and these, this is all, um, if you like, a new pattern that's emerging post uh, widespread vaccination, uh, of which this is the first, I suppose, wave that we have really understood that uh, to be the case. So, um, so a little bit of uncertainty about how things are going to play out over the next, uh, over the medium to long term, as certainly as we approach into the winter, but that's where we are at the moment. And I'll stop there. Thanks, Steph. Thanks, Dave. I'll pass over to Sam for his update. Thank you very much, Stephanie. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about our new guidance on reducing the risks in schools. I'm not going to go through the whole thing in detail, but I am just about to send to people a link, which I've just put into the chat box now, if people want to follow up on any of the specific points. Um, instead, I'm going to try and provide a little bit of context, I think. I'll pull out a couple of the key points, but I'll try and provide a bit of the context behind the guidance as well. Um, so we published this on the 3rd of August. Hopefully people are reasonably familiar with it. Um, the guidance itself is based on the advice of the, of, of the COVID-19 advisory subgroup. So this includes people such as Dave's colleague, DCMO Marion Bain, it includes our chief scientific advisor. It includes Gail Gorman <clears throat> as chief education officer, uh, chief social work advisor, and several other people as well. Um, it's also developed in line with uh, aligned with our education recovery group, which includes stakeholders from across the education landscape. So it's genuinely a co-produced piece of work. Um, it won't surprise you that in producing it, we think about things such as. Um, GERFEC, UNCRC, and we also look at impacts across the four harms of COVID, which are direct and indirect health harms, plus economic and social harms. So in summary, I guess the key points are that the guidance suggests that the mitigations at the start of this term should by and large be the same as those which were in place at the end of last term. Um, however, in does reference some specific modifications. Uh, it suggests that those modifications should be introduced not necessarily immediately, but any time within the first four weeks of the new school term. Um, it also suggests that this guidance will be in place for a period of about six weeks, um, but we will use that period to continue to review the evidence and the data and determine the position going forward beyond that. The period of six weeks isn't chosen at random. It's for a specific reason. In fact, it's for two specific reasons. Um, the first of those is it gives us a good period of time to monitor the impacts of the return to school across a whole range of indicators. Uh, and the second, as Dave has just alluded to, is it gives a period of time for us to ensure that all adults have been offered a second dose of the vaccine and have had two weeks for the efficiency of that vaccine to fully kick in. Um, so I've talked a bit about the modifications. Uh, primarily, those are updated policy on self-isolation, contact tracing and testing um, for close contacts who are under 18 years old. There's a whole load of um, detail behind that, but to try to simplify, effectively uh, boiling it down to two things. If a close contact, an under 18 year old who is a close contact um, is identified, they no longer have to self-isolate for a period of time as was previously the case, but instead we ask that they take a PCR test. And if that PCR test returns a negative result, then they can return to school. And the second key change is to the definition of a close contact, uh, which is now much less prescriptive. Um, schools will have less involvement in identifying close contacts. Test and protect will continue to be involved, but instead of looking at, for example, whole class bubbles, they will simply identify those children and young people who they deem to be of particularly high risk. Um, 
Where there is a positive case in a class one and in form letters will be sent back to families and a template should have arrived at schools to assist with the process for that. So obviously as a result of those changes, uh, one of the um, kind of the knock on effects, I suppose, is that we're looking to remove bubbles within schools, again, more or less with immediate effect. Uh, but the majority of the other mitigations will stay in place whilst we just work through this initial period. Um, a couple of the questions that were asked that I've seen talked about what will happen with particular restrictions in the medium term. So I'm just going to say a little bit about that. So there are potentially three broad scenarios. One of those would be that we retain the mitigations as they currently are. The second one would be that we look to modify around the edges, depending upon where we think there is kind of more or less opportunity to remove restrictions. And the third would be to move to what we call baseline mitigations. Um, the subgroup, which I referred to earlier, will continue to review the evidence on a fortnightly basis. They meet again next week and will help to advise on which of those three scenarios we should be moving towards. To bring it to life a little bit, some of the mitigations I think that would be first in line to be removed um, would be, for example, the use of face coverings in classrooms, um, physical distancing between adults, one-way systems, staggered start and end times, and, for example, restrictions on assemblies and large gatherings. Uh, the very final point I was going to make is there's also a new section at the back of the guidance which refers to readiness planning, and this is kind of aligned to what we call moving towards a pandemic-proof system. It refers to four particular scenarios which may come to pass, at some point in the future, effectively speaking to Dave's point about future uncertainty. Uh, they are comprehensive scenarios, so we don't put probabilities on these, but we have to recognise that they are all possibilities. So at one end of the spectrum, we have schools being open to all pupils, either with baseline mitigations or with even fewer mitigations. At the far extreme of that spectrum, we have a return to remote learning, as we've had previously. And in between, we've got partial opening of schools uh, with pupils either being out of school as a result of self-isolation requirements or possibly as a result of a return to physical distancing requirements. So any, any one of those scenarios is not impossible. What we're asking practitioners, schools, local authorities to consider is in any of those scenarios, have they got in place, for example, appropriate risk assessment procedures, plans for communication, plans for learning, IT provision, uh, understanding regarding staffing implications, and things such as school transport. Um, clearly, that needs to be a proportionate piece of planning, but I think it is um, prudent for the whole system to be thinking about those things now as opposed to being caught on the hop at some point in the future. So there's obviously loads of detail that underpins all of that. I'm happy to answer questions, but I'll maybe leave that by way of an initial introduction. Thanks, Sam and Dave, for your introductions there. It was really helpful. Like Sam said, that was quite a lot of information. So if anyone has any questions or comments they want to make in the chat pane, we can pick up on them. I will move to the sort of Q&A portion of the session with the questions that were submitted. Just to give people a bit of kind of reference for that, I have split them up into practical considerations around masks, vaccines and testing and then some about parental engagement. So practical considerations, not a surprise that that's there. People are concerned about the, the everyday kind of lives of the school. So the first question we've got is actually from a head teacher in DeVries and Galloway. I don't know if we have Wilma Misson then on the call. Forgive me if I've said your surname wrong there, Wilma. Hi, uh, you do have you do have me on the call. Um, Would you like to ask your question? Well, it seems like, it seems like such a, 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 a daft one, but I, I suppose it's at the be we're at the beginning of term. Uh, we've got parents who are wondering about what the beginning of term is going to look like from a kind of a day to day practical what normal school looks like. 
And while I get the big stuff, um, it's actually the day-to-day what you can and what you can't do. So it's the simple things like, um, can the kids bring pens, like new pencil cases in with their own stuff? Because before summer, we weren't able to do that. It was a case that we were providing the equipment because you were trying to cut down on sharing and so on. But do we still need to be saying, don't bring your pencil cases in, don't let, let's let not be sharing things the same way, or are we saying that we can begin to do things a wee bit more normally? Thanks, Wilma. Dave and Sam, feel free to just take whatever question you feel is most appropriate for yourselves. Well, do you, do you want me to start? So, um, so thanks for that. I mean, um, I've just sent my six-year-old in with his new Ninjago bag this morning, so uh, so I'm, I'm hoping it's all right. But um, the, um, uh, I mean, the, these are important things, and you know, signify the rituals that surround school, which are, which are actually really important in, in terms of the socialisation and and the social development of kids, as well as you know how we all interact with it. Um, however, sort of silly they might sound um the um what has changed from a public health perspective is is we have learned as things have gone on that some of the way in which the virus transmits which is still through kind of three predominant routes but one is sort of stuff that uh, sort of virus particles that are left on surfaces one that one that are left on on people and transmit by contact and by and by sort of being close to people and then what and then uh, some that are, are transmitted by aerosols and and so and we've learned the different sort of predominance of some of those and if we're honest some of the different strains of virus have changed in terms of how how those have have spread and the dominance of those routes of transmission but largely the the um, the route around uh, being on stuff uh, so the pencil case thing has 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 become less significant in in the routes of transmission it's not nothing but in terms of the risk associated with um sharing if you like what I, what i would call inanimate objects um so uh, sort of hard equipment and other things uh then um then the risk of that has become much less so uh so from a public health perspective we, we're not we're not too worried about that we still recognize that some of these other routes of transmission are probably the ones that have the best yield in terms of reducing uh, transmission so that's why as Sam was saying, that's why some of these things are still in place in terms of managing flow through schools, managing, uh, uh, maintaining face masks, maintaining some elements of physical distancing. It's a balance, of course, all the time, but but uh, I would worry less about the sort of uh, the hardware stuff and more about the, the human contact bit if you have to choose between them. And just to follow on, that's exactly what the guidance says, actually, is that we are much more relaxed about things such as pencil cases than we were previously. And I'm very glad to hear Dave talking about sending off his own kid with a Ninjago bag because it's my daughter's first day in S1 today. So she has also gone with a brand new set of pencil cases and such like. Um, So I'm glad I'm not out of kilter there. Thanks both. And that'll apply, I'm assuming, to things like reading books, homeschool folders. There's obviously quite a lot of materials that pass between the household and school, so that's really useful to know. The next question, Sam, you already touched upon around staggered arrival and departure times. So not to go into too much to that, so I feel like the answer to that is yes, they're in place at the moment, but they could be disappearing soon. Is that what we're saying? So, so the short answer is yes, they are in place just now. They will be in place almost certainly for the first six weeks of this term. If I was a betting man, I think they will be removed at that point in time. Uh, I can't guarantee that. But what I can guarantee is we will be looking at it and making sure we assess all the evidence and take a balanced decision at that stage. Fab, thank you. I'm going to bring in just now, she's on the call, Karen Kerr, who's a senior learning assistant from Dumfries and Galloway. Karen, are you there? Would you like to ask your question? Nope, that's fine. I can ask it for her. And this question kind of similar to probably the one before. How long will bubbles remain in place? I don't know who would like to start with that one. So bubbles can go now. Well, what we agreed was some of those mitigations, we would give schools effectively a leeway period of the first four weeks so that staff 
weren't having to come in over the summer holidays and make physical adjustments to the school estate. Um, but the policy is within the first four weeks uh, of the new school term, uh, staff can start to make those adjustments. So any time from now on, bubbles can be reduced or well removed altogether. Great, thank you. Again, another very similar question that kind of leads on from the concept of bubbles, I think. Alexandra Burr, do we have you on the call? Would you like to come in and ask your question about supply teachers? Hi there. Hi there. Hello, hi. It's Alexandra, sorry, by the way. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, it was just to say um, how, how many classes are we limited to? Because um, I was asked at one point to cover four different classes in one day, and then I was asked another week to cover equivalent to six classes in a week. Um, is, has that been relaxed or has the number been confirmed? Uh, it was just from, from a supply point of view, do I refuse to take more than four classes in a day? Because I know with learning support, they were limited to one group or one individual in the morning, one in the afternoon, and not moving between schools. I don't know if I don't know if you I don't know if you want to come back from a policy perspective, Sam. I mean, from a from a public health perspective, uh, Sandy or Alexander, if, uh, whichever you prefer. Um, obviously, as we discussed, limit, limiting the the ability for you essentially to come into contact with multiple groups of people and also potentially to act as an asymptomatic vector of, uh, for want of a better word, um, is uh, would would be ideal. But we also recognise that business continuity, for want of a better term, is really important as well. So we, we, how do we balance up those things? Because X doesn't equal Y. Um, so I think it's about being pragmatic, uh, but also um, making sure that you're undertaking all the mitigations that you can do as well to enable you to be safe. So if you can access the, um, the testing uh, if you like the, the testing facilities or testing capabilities that are that are on offer to uh, teaching and support support staff, that's that's really important in lowering that risk, uh, using all the precautions that we've that we've mentioned, um, and and having a, having a dialogue with your potential employers, if you like, about how how you're best used and it is are there pragmatic things, uh, practical things that could help uh, limit limit the amount of movement that you might take. That would be what sort of the clinical advice. There may be there may be a, a more strict policy advice about that, but I'll 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 see if there is from Sam. It's not something I've been close to in terms of the supply the supply teacher issue. Thanks, Dave. Sandy, I suspect you're looking for a number, and I'm afraid there is no number in the guidance. Um, and part of that, as Dave has alluded to, I guess, is there's a bit of an element here of balancing kind of pragmatism and balancing risks and harms. So the guidance talks about trying to limit these things, putting in place risk assessments, et cetera. Clearly, there are other things, as Dave has talked about, which can be done to reduce that risk. Um, but I think probably there's a bit of a common sense approach here, as opposed to me being able to say twice a day, five times a week, whatever it happens to be. OK, I don't think it's, it's uh, any, anybody's particular fault. The supply staff will allocate you or ask you to go to a particular school. And when you arrive there, you're then told it's covering more than just one class in a day. Um, it's just that combination of moving about when uh, other staff are quite restricted. Um, okay, that kind of answers my question to some extent. But yes, I was looking for a, a, a number. Thanks, I, Alexander, this time. Sorry, I've got your name right this time. <laughs> Stephanie, could I just pick up on part of the question in the chat box just whilst I see it? So yeah, simply sure. regarding kind of more rural and island communities and the extent to which the mitigations and the guidance um, is compatible with those particular communities. So I just wanted to say that a lot of the guidance actually does, does provide flexibility and freedom for local tailoring and adaptation of those guidance. So, for example, things like the staggered start and end times, they are not mandated. What they are is they, we, they're actually part of the menu, that, that particular um, suggestion is part of the menu of things which schools can choose from, but we're not saying thou must. We are saying here are some good ways, here are some things you could put in place to help to reduce points of transmission. We're not saying you have to do 
And um, that came about primarily through discussions with colleagues, local government colleagues, COSLA and others to make sure that whilst we had this national guidance, there was absolutely space for local authorities and for particular schools to tailor that approach as best meets their local circumstances. And, and just following up on that rural element, which clearly has different considerations, but also based on the three previous waves that we've had of the pandemic or, or of, the vi of the virus being sort of uh, uh, in high kind of prevalence, is that rural areas have always had a lower lower prevalence and, and lower if you like density of the of the virus so you will so it will be a lower risk starting point that you're at there now school, schools are a bit of an anchor kind of uh sort of institution in some of these communities so we need to be thoughtful about you know just how much is happening there but but ultimately you're, you're operating from a different level baseline level of risk there so you know that pragmatic solution is is absolutely uh, key to being able to deliver for young people and and children in those communities thanks both susie i just want to check with you if there's anything else you want to add from from that kind of rural island perspective before we move on That's fine. So our last question that probably falls under the practical considerations is from Julie Lloyd. I don't know if I've got Julie on the call with us today. Okay, so Julie's question was around, um, are children able to change for PE now? Obviously, that was previously a concern, something that had to be mitigated within schools. So is that one of the restrictions that we're able to, to lift? I'll go first, shall I? So again, there's not hard and fast kind of for particular children, yes, for particular children, no. Um, but again, kind of looking at pragmatism. So we recognise, for example, that changing rooms might have got uh, less ventilation than other parts of school. So that's something to take into account. We probably wouldn't want huge numbers of young people cramming into a small space with you know, relatively poor ventilation all at the same time. Um, equally, recognise that, for example, teenagers in particular might not wish to stay in their PE kit all day in the way that a six or a seven-year-old, well, for example, my, my 10-year-old son would be quite delighted to stay in his sports kit all day long. Um, I suspect my older daughter probably not so much. So there's a degree of pragmatism here, I think, which is um, it would be better not to be using densely crowded changing rooms, but um, recognising also kind of wider health and well-being issues around young people too. Thank you. We've got two questions that are relating to the, the issue of uh, masks, vaccines and testing. Sam, you obviously touched on the idea of face masks. So that question was, what is the likelihood of those masks being removed? And again, I'm thinking the answer is probably yes. Is that right? So, possibly. I think uh, would be what I would say. Um, so that's really nebulous. But coming coming back to the point about where we are in the in the in the in the moment of the of the pandemic, um, and also recognizing that um, it's unfair. It feels unfair at the moment because there are whole swathes of other things that you can do without the need for a face covering. Um, in Scotland, we have kept at least some consistency in some public settings about uh, about face coverings in, if you like, in crowded areas or areas where we think there is still a risk. And we know that there are some outliers in that. We, we acknowledge that. But it really depends on what happens with cases, actually, over the next three or four weeks and where we are with that. Uh, it, as I said, it, it is one of these things that we know does reduce the chance of person-to-person -person transmission, especially within that sort of... Uh, two meter kind of distance um, where you can't mitigate for that for the spacing uh, and where you're not in an outside sort of environment uh, or with or with lots of ventilation so um, uh, 
given that we're heading into autumn, given that we're not quite sure where the cases are going to go, they're likely to be going in an upward trajectory. Um, we just need to be thoughtful. So we are hopeful, but I wouldn't want anyone to go right. We know that we know that we can throw our masks away on October the first because that it might just not be quite that straightforward. Great, thank you. That's a helpful clarification there, Dave. Thank you. I'm going to bring in Elaine Ross if she's on the call to ask her question around um, vaccines. Hi there. It was actually about um, what the, you thought the probability was of staff in schools needing a booster vaccine once we get into the, the winter term. So the majority of my staff at the moment are doubly vaccinated, which makes it a wee bit easier that there won't be the need for self-isolation. Um, they have all signed up to get their flu vaccine, which we're getting in school at the same time as the children, which again gives us another wee layer. But the, the chat is, is starting to go around now whether they think we will need a, a kind of coronavirus booster injection come the winter months. So it was looking for a wee bit of clarity on that. Great, thank you. Great question, and well done for uh, sort of championing um, the what is undoubtedly one of the the, the biggest kind of uh, things that is, has turned this around, which is that the vaccination program. So well done for all of your advocacy on that, um, and for and for encouraging that flu vaccine update. So brilliant, brilliant to hear that. Um, in terms of the booster, it is highly likely that there will be a booster program, um, and it is. Uh, uh, we are we are uh, fairly confident, although we await formal the formal JCVI kind of guidance on it, which will be where it will come from, about how how and when and what that how that's and what that's going to constitute. So, the um, it is likely to follow the same sort of prioritisation as was uh, as was seen at the early part of the COVID vaccination program. So it will be going back um, to people who are most at risk of worse outcomes, who are also most at risk of um, immunity waning uh, from that from that first um, uh, full vaccination program. We're still actually learning quite a lot about what happens post-vaccination with your with the immune system to these particular vaccines. Uh, so we know that actually immune um, immunity is held for uh, quite a long time after it, and when uh, but it varies between different people. So so it will be focused on those that are likely to be most vulnerable to significant COVID uh, disease, rather than if you like going back to sort of blo blocks of um, of people. So it's likely to follow that similar sort of prioritization. But but I think it will be coming. We just haven't got the we just haven't got the clarity about whether it's going to happen at the same time as the flu program, whether it's going to be combined, uh, whether it's going to be separate, how it's going to be staggered. There'll be some supply issues, there'll be some other evidence to emerge uh, before that. But that these are all things that are being actively considered by JCVR at the moment. Thank you, and thank, thank you, Elaine, for your question. Um, we had a few queries around the sort of efficiency and the continued use of the lateral flow tests. Dave, I don't know if you could maybe say a little bit about um, those tests for us. Sure. So, um, as many of you will be aware, so lateral flow tests are different to PCR tests. They're, they're testing for something different. Uh, what they're testing for is essentially... Um, uh, the it's an antigen test, so it's testing whether you've got, um, uh, if you like, viable virus kicking around and your body is kind of making responses to it. Um, so, uh, so it what what that what it's good for is it, it tells it tells you uh, whether you're likely to be infectious because it's saying if whether you've got kind of live virus kicking around. So that's what it's an it's an antigen test. Um, and uh, so that tells you something different to a PCR test. The PCR test is testing for whether you've got remnants of the virus, whether they're infectious or not, still within you. So that's why you can have a positive PCR test for quite a long time after you've recovered from infection. So um, people often think of the PCR as being the good one and the LFT being the bad one. They just test, they're just testing different things. Neither are perfect. Um, and the LFT, the, the lateral flow device tests are um, 
are always better when there is a higher likelihood of um, disease in the in the base population. So the higher the prevalence, the more accurate they become. Uh, so the lower the prevalence, so when if there's no disease around, the likelihood is that you will get quite a high rate of false positives, and there will always be some false negatives. So you'll always miss you'll always miss some some within that. Um, so sorry about all the sort of technical bit, but the bottom line is um, they they do still work pretty well. Um, so we would continue uh, we would continue to advise you using them because it's, they especially are good at picking out people that might be infectious without symptoms. So for people that don't have symptoms, uh, like many of your staff uh, and your colleagues, um, they're really good at picking out uh, folk that could infect other people that would have no idea that they had active virus. Um, now, our supplier is going to change in the next few weeks to months to move to a test that is going to be uh, produced by someone called Gene Orient that's going to be quicker, so it'll be take about 15 or 20 minutes to get a result, and only need to go up the nose, where we know that there's probably more active virus being secreted. So that's great for everyone, because the throat one is miserable, um, and um, those are hopefully going to come online, and, and uh, they, we have a pretty robust uh, whole sort of assurance infrastructure to make sure that they are as good as they can be in terms of telling us what they need to do. No test is perfect, but these those are the ones that are going to be coming online. And we would absolutely uh, ask, you know, if you know when you can to be able to continue using those as uh, as you can. I'll give you an example. So in health and social care, um, we about and these are full, you know fully vaccinated people, asymptomatic testing. We've picked out somewhere in the region of about two and a half thousand, somewhere about two two thousand eight hundred positive cases. That otherwise, would have been in and around possibly quite vulnerable individuals who uh, had no idea that they were positive. Um, so um, it is it is a there's, we do lots and lots and lots of testing. We know that it's very very minimal in terms of the numbers in terms of percentage, but for every one that we pick out, uh, it saves an outbreak or it saves the potential for that to be spread uh, in these settings. So. Um, so the technology is changing all the time. We'd absolutely encourage you to keep using it um, uh, uh, if, and, if and when you can. Thanks, Dave. Sam, the next two questions, the final two questions, I should say, because I'm looking at the time there, are probably for yourself around guidance. And they're both about kind of parental engagement um, guidance. So the first one is when will parents be able to attend events again? So thinking about parents nights, transition events, when will parents be able to be in the school building again? And the second one is are there any pending or new guidelines for resuming home visits for education staff? So, so the short answer to both really is under review uh, particularly as part of the six weeks per six week period, possibly thereafter. But as Dave said earlier, we couldn't promise that at this point in time. Uh, so you will see stuff in the coming weeks. Small caveat on that, of course, for children transitioning from ELC to P1 already, uh, if required, parents are able to support that transition. So there's a little bit of a softening of where we were previously already uh, and maybe more to come in the coming weeks. Great, thanks Sam. That is all the questions we have at the moment folks, unless there are any more questions from the audience at the moment. Or Sam or Dave, I don't know if you have any kind of final remarks you want to make before we close. I just want to say thank you everybody for attending. It's been a real um, privilege to have this opportunity to speak to people and kind of put across some of the, the reasoning behind the guidance. So thank you very much and to you, to yourself, Stephanie, and others for uh, facilitating. Yep, Alex, then my thanks as well then to you and Dave for coming along. I know you're both very, very busy, so we do appreciate you coming along to give us the clarity that we're, we're looking for and to everyone on the call for giving up their time as well to come along and listen. So have a lovely evening, folks, and we will see you soon.